Welcome to our uh, seminar sessions on, on territory and welcome back to the ETH. I hope you had a great uh, break over Christmas and starting uh, last week. And this is the first, first seminar uh, done in collaboration with the chair of Melissa Topalovic uh, with the support of Hans Hortig and Sasha uh, Delz. So if you have questions, uh, please address them uh, directly. And uh, behind the, the camera is uh, Jörg uh, Sovins. So, this is the poster that you have seen. Uh, it was conceived in collaboration with Melissa, uh, Sasha, and, and, and Hans as a kind of diagram. It, it might be overloaded at first sight in terms of what kind of terms. Uh, we would like to, to tackle, and we've been trying to tackle also uh, in, in the past. Uh, there are several, there is a cascade of concepts within this, this diagram, and the first one uh, is, is the one that is probably the closest to us. Now, where did I put up the, the pens? Uh, the term uh, territory the socio-spatial uh, environment that uh, we uh, inhabit, uh, but also the political technology uh, behind it, uh, the laws, the zones, the zoning uh, regulations, the desires that we project uh, on, on territory, and uh, it goes far beyond just uh, land. The second term is urbanism. That's our uh, discipline. Okay. This is what we do as architects, landscape designers, uh, Städtebauer. Uh, this is, this is, we believe in those disciplines that are constantly changing. Uh, and obviously, uh, we are implicated in the production of nature, in the production of the environment and the production of territory. So we have a stake in what we do and what the outcome uh, might be. Uh, the third term, Anthropocene, is the one we would like to tackle uh, today and also question it uh, and try, try to view what we do uh, in view of this new narrative on uh, the globe. Uh, I mean, we've entered some, some uh, theoreticians argue that we have entered a new geological uh, age uh, in which we human have significantly contributed to the production of uh, this environment. And today we would like to focus on primarily on, on this term. But there is another term and that's uh, ecology, binomial expression uh, from the terms, the Greek terms, oikos and, and logos. Oikos meaning uh, house, home, uh, environment, uh, and logos is the science, science of and how to keep that house uh, in good order and if we place it in relationship to the Anthropocene then suddenly our planet becomes you know, the, the house that, that we uh, inhabit. And recently I read a text by Jason in which you ended a lecture uh, with the ecology of hope. So we might address that at the very end of, of your lecture. And then there's a, another term, uh, the term sessions. The fifth term addresses the method of how we would like to proceed. Uh, the rules of the game are very simple. We invite a guest. Uh, he or she offers a proposition. We have invited uh, Nikos Katsikis today as a respondent. Uh, we'll sit in front and debate the propositions offered, and then we open the floor uh, to, to you. Uh, and please write down questions, uh, arguments. If you disagree, please let us uh, know. This is the framework. We have only five sessions uh, this, this semester. And the students have to sign up, I think. Sasha, is that correct at the end of the lecture? They have to sign up and they get the credits with four. So if you do four of the sessions and you sign up, uh, we give you uh, the credits and no paper, only attendance and participation. 
Great. So this is the, the first slide. Our guest... I have too much technology with me. Next slide is... Um, it's what we want to talk today. Uh, some, some geographers have argued that, as a matter of fact, uh, urbanization is the primary uh, force okay? and uh, have suggested another term. Instead of talking about uh, the Anthropocene, uh, have suggested the uh, Urbicene as uh, the, the, the predominant narrative that uh, should be addressed. Uh, and, and today, Jason, uh, who... Uh, framed this term, capitalocene. I mean, urbanization is, is always strongly tied to the uh, economy and to the uh, predominant, uh, let's say, economic systems that drive, drive the world. Uh, and you have argued that probably, rather than talking about the urbanocene and, and, and the anthropocene, we should uh, talk about the capitalocene, a term that is very poetic also when when you know how to pronounce it. So, Jason Moore is, is our guest today. Thank you, Jason, for coming from so far away. Uh, he's an environmental historian and uh, a historical geographer and geographer. This is his space uh, discipline. Uh, and we stumbled uh, on, on you through your writings. So, uh, this is what, this was the homework that Melissa and I uh, did with Hans and, and, and Sasha, uh, First Capitalism in the Web of Life, 2015. Uh, re I think a revolutionary uh, book for, for us. It reframed our uh, thought on it. Second book, 2016, is an editing book. And the third one is extremely easy to read. It, it's a story. And it's a story about the cheap things. Okay? So labor, uh, food, uh, land, uh, etc. Six or seven uh, seven cheap things. Seven cheap things. Uh, highly to be recommended and probably for the students a good entry into your other uh, work. And uh, we've invited Nikos Katsikis, who has also participated in, in the seminar. Uh, he uh, has a, a doctoral of, of, of design from uh, Harvard University, from Graduate School of, of Design, has worked for a long time with Christian Schmid and Neil Brenner in uh, the, the Urban Theory uh, Lab and is now a postdoc at the University of uh, Luxembourg. And I took this as a clip from one of your videos in which in two minutes you explain very clearly the various theoretical models uh, that, that were uh, developed within, within our, our discipline uh, the Global City Network, this is uh, Saskia Sassen, we know it quite well, uh, her, her discourse. Then the world is spicy, the urban age, the London School of, of Economics uh, that was featured at the Biennale many years ago. Uh, then a very old one, a single planetary city by Doxiadis, Constantino Doxiadis, who was one of the first uh, urbanists who started to see the world uh, as an entity and then planetary urbanization as the current, current uh, lens through which uh, to see uh, urbanizations at the global uh, scale. Five-minute video on YouTube, uh, highly recommended. Good. So today, Jason Moore will talk about uh, capitalism, climate, and the geohistorical uh, crisis. Uh, and I've asked him to talk to architects because normally you don't talk to architects, I assume, or sometimes. No, sometimes at the GST you did. Uh, and let's see whether we can engage in uh, discourse. So, Jason, please welcome Jason uh, Moore, and thank you for coming. Well, we're almost there. All right. What a pleasure it is to be here uh, today, and uh, I'm very, very excited to be talking to this audience in particular. Uh, Mark was uh, gracious enough to give me a new copy of his new book, Mirroring Effects, and uh, he said uh, he and his co-author, Carrie uh, Cyrus, Carrie Cyrus uh, say something more clear than I've been able to do uh, in the epilogue to the book. They say, environment making 
requires us to move beyond man and nature. And so the question becomes, how do we do that? How do we move beyond man and nature? So I want to begin with a provocation that the categories of humanity and nature, or sometimes, as I'll talk about it in this course, civilization and nature, are the most dangerous ideas of the modern world. And they are implicated in a whole system of thought that has its roots in the Colombian invasion of 1492. They are implicated in a whole system of thought that has brought us to the present crisis. So the present crisis is a crisis in a fundamental sense. It is a turning point. This is how Earth system scientists talk about it. We are living at the end of the Holocene, a 12,000 year era of unusual climate stability. And this is often discussed in terms of the Anthropocene. And so we want to keep in mind from the beginning that these are categories of geological history. These are not geohistorical concepts. They do not refer in, a, in an immediate and direct way to historical transitions, that is, transitions from one mode of producing life and wealth and power to another. So the end of the Holocene poses fundamental challenges to the dominant models of inquiry across the humanities and social sciences, and also to the two cultures model, that is, of, of science and the, and the human sciences, of the physical and human sciences, this two cultures model that dominates university life. And so modern social thought as a whole has not equipped us well to conceptualize and to narrate climate changes within transformations of human relations of power and reproduction. The hegemonic model, even for many radicals, imagines historical change unfolding as if nature and society, nature, ecologies without humans, society, humans without ecologies, crash into each other like billiard balls. And this is a rather conventional model from what is called coupled systems thinking. What I'm going to propose today is that this is not only analytically misleading in profound ways, it is politically disabling, and it is a representation of systems of thought that have created the problem of catastrophic climate change. So we need to ask you know, what kind of crisis are we in? And indeed, whenever we ask a question about crisis, we are always dealing in the plural. And so in order to grasp the character of planetary crisis, which is also a fundamental crisis of capitalism as we have known it for the past five centuries, in order to deal with the crisis, we have to go beyond man and nature. So I want to cut into this question from one of several vantage points. And to begin by asking, what stories do we need in a time of unprecedented crisis? The climate changes that we'll, we will see in the century ahead will exceed by an order of magnitude the crises that we have seen, the shifts of, of climate that we have seen over the past 12,000 years. And to be clear, we are no longer waiting for the climate crisis to hit. It has hit. So the Chinese character for crisis combines those for danger and opportunity. But to seize the opportunities ahead, we'll need more than a clear sense of reality. We will also need hope. So let me underscore, our, let me underscore the point by saying that a crisis is more than a very bad situation. That's how many scholars, many journalists use it in the media, a humanitarian crisis, a hunger crisis. But a crisis is something more than a very bad situation. It is a fundamental turning point in the life of a complex system. That complex system could be the biosphere. It could be a urban network. It could be large urban, it could be large bioregions like Amazonia. It could be long run historical systems of organizing uh, the world color line and the world gender line, especially important in an era of climate patriarchy and climate apartheid. It could be indeed civilizations as a whole. 
And that's something that we want to get a, get a grasp on. So here we see a proxy for uh, climate changes over the past 2,000 years of the Holocene and how they are connected to significant moments, how major, major shifts in climate, usually towards colder and wetter weather over the past 2,000 years, have been without exception almost uh, uh, connected to fundamental shifts in the, lives, uh, in the lives of civilizations from the crisis of Rome in the third century all the way to the crisis of the late 18th century. So what we want to do is to get a sense of how climate as a geophysical process becomes entangled with relations and systems of domination, of production and reproduction, of rule. So that the geo, that's the way that we can transform our understanding of biophysical and biospheric changes into geohistorical changes in which climate is not the determining element but in which climate determinations are always present in the history of civilization. So this is crucial if we want to come to grips with the present crisis of the 21st century which is self-evident is a crisis of the biosphere, a fundamental turning point in the conditions of life on planet Earth, but also a fundamental shift in the life of capitalism as we have known, known it. So to say something is geohistorical is to put the moment of climate determination in there without saying, oh, the climate determines everything, as if the climate just comes in and smacks into uh, society or global civilization. So. What we saw in both the 4th century and the 14th century were moments of profound climate shift. There were also, as you can see from these two slides, and I'll sort of tack back and forth, these were also moments of civilizational crisis. That is, they were moments of geohistorical transformation. And there's a missing history uh, uh, in the conventional model, which again is humanity versus nature, uh, as if they were two separate systems. They are not two separate systems, if our concern is human history. Uh, there are two massive transformations that are left out of these stories. First, major climate shifts in the Holocene have, without exception, destabilized ruling classes. The long drought across the Eurasian steppe in the fourth century occasioned the great migrations that brought an end to Roman power in the West. The great peasant and urban revolts of the long 14th century in the opening decades of what we call the Little Ice Age brought an end to feudal production arrangements across Western and Central Europe. So first of all, we want to remember that moments of climate change are also moments of political possibility. They are moments sorry, uh, uh, and the, the, these are also moments of significant possibility for the improvement of the well-being of the vast majority. So we are better served by a model of crisis and transformation rather than collapse in uh, as in the title of Jared Diamond's uh, uh, famous and uh, uh, absolutely counterproductive text. Uh, yes, there, are, there is a collapse, there is a collapse of, of ruling class power, but it doesn't just happen by itself. So for sure, these are eras marked by the collapse of ruling classes, of the 1% of their uh, 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 different eras. The Roman oligarchs in their villas were largely displaced in the 4th and 5th and 6th centuries, and the power of aristocratic classes across Western Europe was dramatically com compromised. And importantly, as I just suggested, for the vast majority, life improved. Peasantries following the collapse of Rome in the West reorganized social life. They reestablished uh, village life and they, re and they occupied the villas. This was an era of improved class inequality, but also of uh, class equality, rather, and uh, uh, importantly, of gender equality, in which birth rates decline and population stabilizes at a much lower rate. This is not the dark ages that you may have encountered in your uh, school books. 
And so there is a moment of vital agency on the part of peasants and workers in these moments of climate change that are often very difficult, of course, for the vast majority. But depending on the political outcome can also be moments of significant, you know, of the significant improvement in living standards. This uh, is a chart of the improvement of the living standards of the laboring classes in Western Europe between 1350 and 1500. What happens in 1350? This is uh, the uh, heart of the Black Death. But in contrast to the man versus nature and Malthusian arguments, to which we will turn um, in the second part of this talk, uh, this was not uh, the result of uh, uh, dem demography alone. This was a result of the class struggle. Indeed, the demise of feudal arrangements in the countryside in Central and Western Europe was the result of a historic defeat of the ruling classes on the part of peasants and workers. So, what stories do we need for today's long era of crisis, and from where do we find hope? I think that we need to begin by recognizing that today's state shift, that is the end of the Holocene and the dawn of the geological Anthropocene, that today's state shift is about more than the biosphere. The disconnection that is realized and expressed in the statement that it is easier to imagine the end of the world than the end of capitalism, that has to be engaged. And it comes from a kind of disconnection or a kind of alienation with two major moments. One is a truly massive problem in the history of environmental thought, which is history doesn't matter. This is a story of man versus nature. This is a problem inscribed in human nature and that uh, this is a problem that can be resolved through technical means rather than political means. And we'll return to that as we move on. So this is the man-nature, or what I have called green arithmetic. Nature plus civilization adds up to crisis. And that process is not just about man and nature. It is about the whole set of binaries, of either or binaries that have shaped the modern world. That is centrally the binaries of colonial and class power, of rich and poor, of imperial, uh, of empire and colony, but those are in turn also deeply related as Raj Patel and I show in A History of the World and Seven Cheap Things. They are also deeply related and indeed lived by the vast majority through the binaries of gender, man and woman, and race, white and not white. And this is a result of what I would call a civilizational fetish. So of course a fetish is following Marx a uh, tendency to extract one moment, one part, and make that an essential reality rather than seeing the whole field of relations. And everything that Marx says about commodity fetishism was prefigured, indeed centuries before, from the 16th century, by civilizational fetishes. So that's a, that's a sort of big uh, uh, term, but we need to have a language to talk about the process through which we come to accept a world that is an either-or world, a black and white world, a man versus nature world. And these, these civilizational fetishes have drawn the lines of class, of, of empire, of race, of gender, of sexuality, that have shaped modern life and power, production and reproduction at every turn. And so all of these questions are intimately connected with the web of life, both as a cultural claim, this is nature over here, this is civilization over here, and with the actual environmental histories of the planet over the past five centuries. So this means if we take the idea that human relations are fundamentally entangled within webs of life and the web of life as a whole, the biosphere as a whole, if we take that seriously, it means that we understand that climate changes in the Holocene have always also been human crises. Moments of climate change have been 
even in the relatively mild Holocene moments of political and economic and cultural and environmental crisis of fundamental turning points. They involve every layer and every dimension of human life, our struggles of life making, and today capitalism's relations of profit making and profit taking. And we'll get to a little bit of that history in just a moment. But it's one thing to say humans are part of nature, and it's another thing to put that into practice in our analytics and in our politics, because it profoundly destabilizes the modern worldview, which is premised on a series of binary formulations. You'll hear me say this again and again, that these are either or formulations of man and nature, civilization and savagery. And that's a worldview that really can be broken down into two basic parts. On the one hand, it seems to operate on this humanity versus nature model, as I've been saying uh, uh, at some length. Uh, on, an, on the other hand, the humanity nature model is a problem for reasons that go beyond how we study the world and how we communicate about the world. It's a problem that goes beyond what's analytical. We are used to thinking about capitalism and the capitalist scene as an economic system. It's not. It includes a particular kind of economic logic that is growth for growth's sake, that is accumulation for the sake of more accumulation. But it is not reducible to the economic. So even when, so we want to be very clear about that model, the, the result, if we say that capitalism is about an economic system, almost always we go back to this model, this green arithmetic model of humans and the environment, as if these are separate domains of reality. Capitalism is many things, uh, but fundamentally it is a way of organizing nature. It is a way of organizing the web of life. Yes, in the interests of endless accumulation, but it can only organize a system of endless accumulation through new and powerful systems of domination. And here you have the emergence of, uh, of this model from the very earliest moments. This is not a process that begins in the 19th century, as we will learn. Before there could be factories in Manchester making textiles made, with, made from cotton that was, of course, produced by slaves, and we'll get to that. Before there could be this, there had to be this civilizational fetish that was not only man and nature, it was civilization and nature. We must become the masters and possessors of nature to quote René Descartes in the early 17th century. So what is the alternative here? Well, the alternative is something that we've called the world ecology conversation. And this does recognize capitalism is indeed an ecology of endless capital accumulation. We have to take that very seriously. But that is not the whole story. There's no economic life without the web of life, and there's no economics without systems of power and cultural domination. So world ecology suggests that capitalism is, is at once a producer and product of the web of life. Producer and product. You want to keep that in mind. We are inside the web of life, and the web of life is inside of us. Capitalism is inside the web of life, and the web of life is inside capitalism. This is the fundamental point to grasp if we want to understand the planetary crises of the 21st century. We cannot pretend that the technological and political and cultural and economic uh, sets of relations that we associate with capitalism or with modernity are somehow outside of the changes of, of the climate crisis. They are inside each other. They are doubly internal. Climate change is inside of capitalism. Capitalism is driving climate change. So this is one of the fundamental alternatives to understanding the world. So again, we want to go 
uh, to this, this is uh, early 18th century uh, global uh, cartography, and it gives us a very good sense of the man and nature model. I'm going to refine this a bit. But the capitalism does not emerge in Europe. It emerges in the space in between the man and nature uh, 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 billiard balls here. It emerges uh, through the relations, the creation of what is often called an Atlantic world economy, um, but which could also be called a modern Pangea. And I'll get back to that in just a moment. So the rise of capitalism from this standpoint was not just about economics. It was not just about expelling peasants from the land and putting them to work in factories or in the cities or on ships. It was also fundamentally about the expulsion of the vast majority of humans from membership in humanity. Most humans all the way into the 21st century, still are not regarded as part of civilization. The language of developed world and developing is the modern form of global apartheid, which has become climate apartheid in the present context. So uh, here I just give you a taste of, of the uh, dynamics that were going on in the 16th, 17th, and 18th centuries that were formative of what we today call fossil capitalism or capitalism dependent on coal and oil and gas. The, the essential condition for it beforehand, but also the ongoing condition was to create these lines of civilization and savagery. So in this, we can see uh, women were, of course, expelled from humanity in the 16th and 17th century and have engaged in centuries of struggle to gain even uh, a, a modest recognition of their rights. They were, in Silvia Federici's words, the savages of Europe. Africans were monsters. In Peru, uh, the Peruvians, the Andeans, working in the mines, they became naturales in the language of the Spanish conquerors. So we carry around in our heads the idea that humanity and nature are innocent descriptions. And I'm going to suggest they are not innocent. So we use the phrase anthropogenic global warming to describe climate change. But of course, to say anthropogenic made by humans is neither innocent nor accurate. The reality is that the two greatest superpowers of the last two centuries, Britain and the United States, are responsible for 37% of all greenhouse gas emissions. That tells us something important. Climate change is not anthropogenic, made by humans. It is capitalogenic, made by capital. So, we can dig even deeper. The problem isn't just our descriptions of, of crisis, that's important. The problem is that humanity and nature from 1492 have been what scholars call real abstractions. We might think of real abstractions as practical assumptions that shape how lands are conquered, life is ruled, the work of nature is extracted and appropriated. We all live in trouble, real abstractions all the time. We all know these in our daily lives. Man and woman, straight and queer, white and not white. While the reality is that we know there are many, many more than two genders, two sexualities, two races, and so on and so forth. So what's the alternative? The alternative that, that I and others have been unpacking is the idea of capitalism as a world ecology, as an ecology of power, of production and reproduction in the web of life. That we, we, we ask fundamental questions about connectivity and about fields of power, fields of movement, and world historical patterns that move beyond the colonizer's model of the world, which is, again, civilization and savagery. So if human activities and relations, that is, the food we gather and prepare, the clothes we make and wear, whose lives and whose work we value and whose we do not, the cities we build and the rulers we accept, if all these unfold through the web of life, if all these are connective stories, 
between humans and the rest of nature and the, of nature within human relations and human relations within nature, we begin to have a very different sense of possibility. The stories we tell of our possible pasts and the stories we tell of our possible futures begin to diverge from the modern worldview and the conventional narratives, even for those of a radical persuasion. So a different set of possibilities begins to emerge. So we are living through two other state shifts beyond the state shift in the biosphere. One is the state shift in the modern world system. Modernity in this way of thinking is an ecology, a world ecology of power, capital, and nature. It's a way of organizing the web of life with a singular purpose, the endless accumulation of capital, the endless pursuit of growth for growth's sake. And this is why I call the modern world a capitalist world ecology. It is one in which the pursuit of power, the co-production of natures, and the accumulation of capital, these three moments are enmeshed and entangled in each other at every turn, and they are enmeshed and entangled in every nook and cranny of life. So today, of course, we have a very different model. Um, so our second state shift is intellectual. The Anthropocene does not represent a fundamental shift in the modern uh, cosmology. It is very much business as usual that pretends it is something else. And I'll, I'll, talk, I'll speak to that in just a moment, but I want to underline that the modern cosmology of humans versus nature leads to what James Ferguson, in a very different context, called an anti-politics machine. That is, that the Anthropocene reduces questions of politics to technological change, to geoengineering, to everything except what brings us a more just and sustainable world, which is to say collective and democratic action, democracy, real, genuine, uh, democratic uh, rule uh, uh, by the vast majority. So these, the Anthropocene reveals a, an ecology of hopelessness because it refuses to find hope in the collaborative and collective human action that is committed to justice and equality and sustainability, all connected. But of course, there is an a, a very real Anthropocene. This is the geological Anthropocene, and it has its definite markers of nuclear testing, chicken bones, and plastics. What a wonderful uh, uh, legacy modernity will leave to uh, future uh, future humans if they exist on this planet. But if we are concerned with history, we are not living in the Anthropocene, the age of man. We are living in the Capitalocene, the age of capital, the era that is determined, shaped by the rules of reproduction of capital. And so we want to keep this in mind as we move forward. So just to remind you, the Capitalocene is not economics is everything. There is an economic logic that is powerful and dynamic, but capitalism does not live by capital alone. Indeed, it, the Capitalocene argument points out, and this is why I call it an ecology of hope, that the present crisis is a historical creation. It is not the output of some abstract law of population, some abstract law of innovation or technological development. It points out, the Capitalocene argument points out, that our crisis today is the accumulation of five centuries of violence, appropriation, and exploitation. So, what we want to do is to come to grips with this double reality of the crisis today. The geological Anthropocene, which speaks to absolutely pressing and urgent uh, transformations, state shifts within the biosphere in a biophysical sense, but also the state shift within capitalism itself. That is, how do we put together a crisis of life-making and a crisis of profit-making and profit-taking, along with the resistances to that process. So this, to grasp these two moments together, is fundamental. And scholars across the world have not done a great job. They are starting to wake up. 
to this reality. The movements, in some ways, food justice movements, climate justice movements, are in some ways ahead of the scholars on this account. We need to put these two moments, the crisis of life-making and the crisis of profit-making, together. So what's stopping us? Well, here is a poster from the first Earth Day in 1970. We have met the enemy and he is us. So this gives us a very powerful statement that is still, unfortunately, very strongly with us. We are all responsible for this disastrous state of affairs, right? Humans did it. We are destroying the Earth, says the scientist. Well, we can't argue with that, right? Well, not so fast. So we are destroying the Earth. Who's this we? And uh, uh, one of my favorite bumper sticker slogans, climate change is a man-made problem with a feminist solution. And I think that we need to take that seriously. So when the scientist in the cartoon announces that we are destroying the, the, the planet, he is saying something, on the one hand, totally reasonable. On the other hand, totally insane. On the one hand, it's totally reasonable to explain biophysical transformations in terms of the activities of a species. On the other hand, such a, such a uh, statement explains absolutely nothing about what really drives climate change. It says nothing about history. It says nothing about power. If you are reckoning with climate crisis today and you cannot grasp the, the longer history of that process of what drives climate crisis, then you are uh, uh, absolutely misreading the problem and your politics will compound the problem rather than deal with it. So uh, again, we have this discourse coming from, from the geophysical sciences. Humans did it and this leads to as if humans doing it were like snakes being snakes and dogs being dogs and, and all of that. It feeds an ecology of hopelessness. So this was captured in Jason Box, a, uh, a young glaciologist at the time, uh, who tweeted uh, that we are all fucked. Well, uh, that is really expressive of the separation of man versus nature. If you see the problem as a geophysical crisis here and a social crisis here instead of an entangled and unified geohistorical crisis, then indeed one should espouse the ecology of hopelessness. But we should ask which humans did it. Of course, we live in a planet, unfortunately, in which seven white, eight, eight white guys, sorry, eight, tomorrow it'll be seven, eight white guys own more wealth than the bottom 3.5 billion people on this planet. 71% of the world's population lives on less than $10 a day. So we have we have a moment where we have to begin to step back and ask about what kinds of stories of crisis, what kinds of stories of hope do we need to get to, uh, uh, to an effective analytics, to effective and compelling forms of representation, uh, uh, ways of transforming our built environments. Uh, we'll need uh, 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 architecture more than ever as every single planet, uh, every single city that is on a coastline on this planet must be moved and rebuilt. So we, we have to take these questions enormously uh, seriously. Um, but for these questions, post-1968 environmentalism doesn't give us much to work with. The great biologist Paul Ehrlich remember that name, we'll come back to him, in his 1968 bestseller, The Population Bomb, uh, uh, set us out on an absolutely ahistorical path. This is the path of, of history denialism. There's climate denialism, there's history denialism. They're closely linked, but this is history denialism. He announced the battle to feed all of humanity is over. In the 1970s, hundreds of millions of people are going to starve to death. And then he asked, well, how did we get into this bind? His answer, well, it all happened a very long time ago. Billions of years of evolution have fixed in us the urge to reproduce. So the problem is, I mean, you think I'm going far back when I say 1492 is the origin of crisis. He wants to go back 3 billion years. Uh, there is a particularly 
uh, important statement of the ecology of hopelessness. And even if you want to say it's somehow about biologically modern humans, we still have to account for the fact that biologically modern humans have been around for about 250,000 years. So that doesn't give us much. Now, what's the other big candidate here? Here, we're flipping all around here. Uh, uh, what's the other big candidate? Well, the Industrial Revolution. That's the source of all our problems. It's the Industrial Revolution. We never really learn too much about the Industrial Revolution, but really our image is something like this uh, lithograph from uh, Manchester in the middle of the 19th century. You have the belching smokestacks. It, it, it's because it's a little colored. It's dirt, it feels dirty. We have this, this image of over pollution and industry and coal. And that's really been revived in a fairly strong way. And uh, this, this story of the Industrial Revolution of the 19th century as the origins of planetary crisis is completely wrong. And this story is also an ecology of hopelessness, and I'll try to explain why that is as well. Now, it's true that what happens in the 19th century was hugely important, but it was not the beginning. And if you want to understand how to deal with a problem, think of any problem in your personal life, any intellectual problem, you have to look at where it began. Where did it start? If you don't know where the problem begins, you are going to be disabled in how you move forward forward. You aren't going to be able to think it through. Well, so what we want to do is we want to understand the origins of the problem. It doesn't begin with factories. The factories are the result of the origins of capitalism, which are also the origins of planetary crisis. So we have to go back to the environment-making revolution of the long 16th century, roughly from a few decades before Columbus. Columbus lands in 1492 until the middle of the 18th uh, uh, century. So we want to get a sense of this long era of transformation. And I won't go through everything in this story, uh, but I want to highlight a few, just a few key moments. First of all, this was, these centuries before, between 1450 and 1750 were the centuries of an environment-making revolution in urbanization and landscape change, in transportation infrastructures, in, uh, and, and uh, in modes of thought, modes of, of, of art and representation and, and mathematics and science botanical knowledge, everything. This was an era of ecological revolution unprecedented in human history, save for the Neolithic Revolution, the dawn of agriculture at the beginning of the Holocene, that is about 12,000 years ago. So this is an extraordinary moment. And what we, what we have here is, is a, a 17th century uh, uh, representation of the uh, Spanish genocide in the Americas, which we need to keep in mind because the, the productive and destructive capacities of capitalism are always tightly linked. But what, what I want to give you is a sense of the, on the one hand, the, the, the rapid character of environmental change, but also how capitalism put natures of every kind to work. And when I say put natures to work, I mean human natures as well. So on the one hand, let me just give you one small but expressive contrast to give you a sense of, of how significant this shift between medieval Europe and early capitalism really was. So as we know, medieval Europe uh, had seen massive deforestation across Western and Central Europe. After 1450, however, Comparable deforestation occurred in decades, not centuries. So let me give you an example. In medieval Picardy, northeastern France, it took 200 years to clear 12,000 hectares of forest in the 12th and 13th centuries. Now, for, move forward four centuries in the 1650s in northeastern Brazil at the height of the sugar boom. 12,000 hectares of forest was cleared in a single year. So that's two orders of magnitude. That's how much faster uh, environmental change, landscape change was occurring. And it wasn't just landscape change, it was the whole ensemble of relations that make possible landscape uh, change. New regimes of racialized and gendered knowledge, new systems of capital, new systems of thought and mathematics and rationalization, uh, uh, new uh, forms of empires the, uh, uh, that 
that overseas global empires had never been sustained before in human history. So we want to understand that whenever we see a geophysical transformation, we are also seeing a transformation in the whole ensemble of human relations that we call cultural, economic, political, and so forth. But the other key point is that in the neoliberal era, we have taken to heart the idea that consumption drives environmental change, and we've also been given over to the idea that capitalism works by destroying natures. And there is a lot of destruction, for sure. But we also want to understand that capitalism works because it puts natures of every kind to work. And here, I think if we want to understand the origins of planetary urbanization, we go to early capitalism's most audacious uh, innovation and creation that was also, let me underscore, a moment of genocide. That Columbus's invasion re, uh, began the process of putting uh, Pangaea, which had separated uh, 175 million years earlier, of putting Pangaea back together in the interests of endless accumulation after 175 million years. So this was an extraordinary moment, not just for the plunder of empires, but much more importantly, for the emergence of new production systems that would eventually culminate in those Manchester factories that I showed you a picture of just a few minutes ago. If you want to understand the modern factory as one of the sites of modern environmental crisis, then you have to go to the sugar plantations and the silver mines of the Americas in this period. That is where the organizational capacities, the organizational knowledge, the, uh, capital, the systems of, of uh, financing, of credit, of capital, systems of coerced labor, that is where they developed and uh, where only later would that mature um, into the Industrial uh, Revolution as we've known it. And I also want to point out that this was not, I say this is often uh, about, uh, the rise of capitalism is not just about economics. We have to understand that this was also about the, the, the movement towards what I've called capitalism's triple helix of environment making. That is the fusion of credit and debt on the one hand, of conquest and coerced labor. As we show in Seven Cheap Things, this is a process that was already ongoing uh, when Columbus invades the New World in 1492. In fact, the invasion of the New World was the, the third of three ethnic cleansing slaving campaigns over the previous two decades. Uh, the, the invasion and cleansing, ethnic cleansing and slaving of the Canary Islands, the final reconquest of the Iberian Peninsula with the conquest, the campaign and conquest uh, uh, of Granada, and the uh, invasion of the Americas. They were all financed. We have to remember that war then as now, now as then, is financed on borrowed money. And uh, these conquests really had nothing profitable except for slaves. So we want to understand that the emergence of the world color line is there uh, 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 really from the beginning that, that the, the, this, this synergy of conquest and capital and coerced labor is there from the beginning. Now, uh, and oh, by the way, at the fall of Malaga, guess who was there when every single one of the inha inhabitants of uh, Jewish and Muslim inhabitants of the city were sold into slavery? Columbus was there at Malaga. Columbus has a very interesting biography that, that puts uh, many of these key moments together. So we want to understand the creation of modern Pangaea and the process of putting natures to work as a first step towards a massively fractured, highly unequal, and violently policed global system. And what was its decisive logistical innovation? It was the European ship. And of all the ships, one was pivotal, the slave ship. The formation of capitalist agriculture, of the modern proletariat, of modern imperialism, relied on the formation of a world color line and the racialization of work that linked two real abstractions, white and not white, 
civilization, and nature. Indeed, racism looms so large in modern climate change that we do well to call the present a civilization of climate apartheid. And we do well to remember that the origins of planetary crisis owe more than a little to the slave ship. So uh, we might call the present world not spaceship Earth, but slave ship Earth. And so this was a moment, uh, this was a moment of uh, putting nature to work, but also a profound capitalogenic climate crisis. Now, we often forget that this is not the first climate crisis that capitalism has faced. The first climate crisis that capitalism faced was what historians long called the general crisis of the 17th century, in which the very most inhospitable uh, 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 moments of the Little Ice Age occurred in this 17th century. It was a moment of the low point of solar radiation uh, reaching uh, planet, uh, the, the planet, the so-called Maunder Minimum. It was a moment of volcanic activity. The volcanoes erupt. They uh, put aerosols into uh, the upper atmosphere, decrease the amount of sunlight reaching the planet Earth. But, oh yes, this is the Orbis, or global spike. One of the signatures for dating the Anthropocene from the great biogeographers, Lewis and Maslin. Uh, why, do, why do CO2 concentrations uh, decline in this era? Because of the New World genocides. So people die, the, 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 the uh, indigenous peoples were killed and the forest grew back. It absorbed so much carbon that it intensified the uh, crises of the time. So you can get a, a, a feel for just how dramatic the 90% or more uh, 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 death rate of the New World genocides. But we can also understand this in terms of the, the ways that, that capitalism faced this crisis was by moving dramatically towards the tropical world and to empowering the system of racialized labor and of racialized production through the sugar plantation, the most dynamic sector of early capitalism. And we can see that that uh, uh, capitalism from the beginning was not about what happens in Europe, but about this hungry, ceaseless movement towards the frontiers. Capitalism is a system of cheap nature because it is so colossally inefficient that we have to, uh, come, we have to reckon with how every great wave of capitalist industrialization from the 16th century all the way to the neoliberal era has been premised on opening up new frontiers through violence, through finance, to secure cheap labor, cheap food, cheap energy, and cheap raw materials. So what was available to capitalism in the crisis of the 17th century, which was the great frontier here, and here we have a, a, a map of the political unrest of the 16th century. What was available to capital and empire then is not available anymore. There are no frontiers to go to. There is nothing comparable to the great slaving uh, frontiers and the opening up of the Americas. Uh -huh. So what about, the, what about the Industrial Revolution? Yes, the Industrial Revolution was very important, but we have to remember it is not an English story. England was one node, one moment of that process. We ha if we want to understand the colossal transformations of this era, we have to go not to Manchester, but we have to go, and not to the steam engine, and James Watt's rotary steam engine, 1784, you might remember from your textbooks. It's, that's not where the story begins. The, the key machine of this era was the cotton gin, which makes possible the cotton that then the steam engine is refined and developed after 1784 to ultimately manufacture all those textiles and give us the classical picture of the Industrial Revolution. And the, the, so the crucial machine is the cotton gin, but the crucial technology is racism and racialized labor. And, and that's important in a double register, one of which you see here, you see uh, uh, African, uh, enslaved Africans, but you also see a story of Indian removal and genocide. 
So again, these different moments of the, one moment of the racialization of labor is producing a surplus and expelling the uh, Africans were never part of civilization. Uh, uh, they, in, to be a slave was to be in the realm of nature and to be treated as such. But also another moment of this was the, the simple and straightforward extermination of American Indians that was necessary in order for the cotton to be grown in places like the Mississippi Delta. So this is an important story, and of course it was also always contested. All right, so as we wrap up the last uh, part of this talk, we want to ask the big questions that get us to an ecology of hope. We want to ask, why do we still think that humanity is the cause of planetary crisis? Why do we still frame it in terms of civilization or society and nature? And it has a lot to do with this civilizational fetish, this tendency to treat nature and society as a relation of, of material objects rather than internally related to each other. And so we have bad history, as I've been trying to uh, hint at, and of course we also have the legacy of Maltus, who is, uh, uh, really deserves everything uh, bad ever said about him. But I'm not going to start with Maltus, I'm going to start with Bucky Fuller and Spaceship Earth. Now, Bucky Fuller was a uh, committed anti-Maltusian, so I'm not going to give him too, too uh, hard a time. But we have to remember the moment at which we are given Spaceship Earth and also uh, Earthrise, which you see uh, from the whole Earth catalog, and the Blue Planet from 1972. And what's, what's interesting is the degree to which historians of environmentalism have ignored the salient geohistorical reality of this era of 1968 to 1974. This is the era in which the rule of capital and empire was challenged as never before. And that's important to keep in our, in our heads. That this, this moment of the celebration of we're all in this together, and I think we are all in this together, but we are not all equally responsible. Uh, there is a moment of, uh, and, and, and what's happened, I see this with students all the time, but of course it's, it has much wider implication, is there is a conflation or confusion that we are all connected, yes indeed, and we are all responsible. And, and so we are not all responsible for the state of the crisis today. We all have an ethical responsibility to do something appropriate about the crisis, but that doesn't mean we all created it. We'll return to that in a moment. But Spaceship Earth, so here we go, Spaceship Earth, this was really the first super metaphor of modern environmentalism. It was one of those metaphors that scarcely demanded clarification in the space race era. Leading establishment intellectuals and politicians like Barbara Ward and two-time presidential candidate Adlai Stevenson snapped up the term without delay. And for Ward and Stevenson and for Nixon, President Nixon, who, used the, who didn't use the term but the sentiment clearly just a few years later, for these ruling class figures, the moral challenge of saving the global environment became a powerful tool of the world's 1% at a time when their rule was challenged as never before. In 1972, at the first Stockholm Environment Conference, the Conference on the Human Environment, which was strongly supported by the United States, you could not mention two words in that conference, in the official proceedings of the conference, and they were Vietnam War. Uh, uh, I don't know how many people here know this, but the word ecocide is a term coined by a journalist writing about the American uh, uh, use of Agent Orange and Agent Blue in Vietnam, in Vietnam at the same time time. So we have to come to terms with the powerful anti-communist and pro-systemic character of the whole earth. We're all in this together. And uh, uh, incidentally, the, uh, uh, the fellow behind the whole earth catalog was a student uh, whose name escapes me at the moment. Uh, the, be, behind the whole, he will come to me in a moment. But he was a student of Paul Ehrlich's in Stanford. Who? Yes. Yes, Stuart Brand. Yes. Yes, Stuart Brand was a student. I don't know why that escaped me. Stuart Brand was a student of Paul Ehrlich's 
in, in, uh, at Stanford in the late 1950s. All right, so now we're going to uh, uh, go to Ehrlich. So Ehrlich opens the population bomb. And I know some of you may have seen this. It's not important to read everything, but he recounts the, in the opening pages of the book his, by the way, the book is published by the American Environmentalist Organization, the Sierra Club. That's an important connection. Uh, Ehrlich opens the book with an account of his story to Delhi in 1965. He and his family went, and he writes about people eating, people washing, people sleeping, people visiting, arguing, screaming, defecating, and urinating, people clinging to buses, People, 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 he says. We were, you know, and he says, well, it seemed like anything could happen to us, but of course nothing did. And ever since that night, I've known the feel of overpopulation. So racial anxiety practically drips off the page here. And what's striking about this is that Ehrlich feels something. What does he feel? He feels overpopulation, not poverty, not the enduring legacy of colonial domination, but too many people. Somehow, all of a sudden, there were just too many people aboard Spaceship Earth, what he called a spacecraft with a limited carrying capacity. Now, here's where it's interesting. Somewhere between two and a half million people lived in Delhi when Ehrlich visited in 1965. London where decisions were made about India's population for nearly two centuries housed three times as many people. So that's not an accidental point. Britain's rise to world power was intimately connected to India, which had been an enormously prosperous region that became poor after the bad luck of meeting Englishmen with guns. As recently as 1943, Britain had allowed three million Indians to die in a horrific famine while grain surpluses were stocked up uh, elsewhere in the empire. Faced with offers of food relief from Australia and Canada, Britain said no. Not to worry, said Churchill, the Indians, a beastly people with a beastly religion, breed like rabbits. Note the environmentalist discourse. These people are not part of civilization. They are part of nature. They breed like rabbits. Now, so this was not, of course, the first time that Britain had imposed a famine on a colony. In the 1870s and again in the 1890s, uh, the, the, uh, South Asia had experienced what Mike Davis calls the late Victorian Holocaust. Tens of millions perished in these famines, even as Britain was taking food out of South Asia. It had happened earlier in Ireland, the so-called potato famine, which is not a potato famine at all, it's an imperial famine. And Britain, again, was taking food out of Ireland as one-third of the Irish people died, one-third uh, emigrated, and one-third survived. So... This is, uh, there is an intimate connection also to this with population thinking, with Malthusian thinking. Thomas Malthus, and I won't go into the whole story because we're towards the end, but Thomas Malthus occupied the first chair in political economy at a certain college. Which college? The East India Company College. And so the, the link between empire and populationism and environmental thinking is intimate. Now, we want to go to a different moment of, of history. We want to go to the slave ship. And the slave ship tell, uh, uh, is a, a, it conjures some of the same images as Ehrlich's feel of overpopulation. And this is from the uh, autobiography of Olada Equiano, who had survived. Oops, sorry. What did we do here? We have to go back to presentation. Oh, no, we're there. Sorry about that. Um, uh, Olada Equiano had survived this middle passage. And he writes, he writes of, of the, the, the smells and the, the sense of, of suffocation and, and uh, violence and misery that is going on that is very, very close to the uh, sense that Ehrlich gives us of, uh, the, uh, uh, of Delhi in 1965. And so imagine, if you will, that 
Ehrlich goes back in time, sorry about this, goes back in time and somehow visits one of these slave ships. And so he's visiting a slave ship instead of Delhi. And what he, what he does is he says, oh, you know, these slave ships are overpopulated. If only we could reduce the numbers on the slave ship. If the slave ships could just cover the one, carry the 100 slaves that they're built for, if they could just meet their carrying capacity, then everything would be okay. Because the slave ships, of course, are overpopulated. So we must reduce the numbers of people on the slave ships. Now, that might sound absurd, and it is. But to say that the problem with slave ships is carrying capacity rather than a toxic stew of imperialism, racism, and capital accumulation is basically the same thing as announcing that India's problem in 1965 was overpopulation. So maybe a metaphor for our world is not spaceship Earth, but slave shipper. And you might think, well, that's a very dark metaphor. How is that an ecology of hope? Well, here's the thing. The slave ship itself was a site of profound and often effective resistance against the worst, most dangerous, most violent forms of capitalist rule that we have known. Over 500 slave ship revolts were recorded. Over 100 slave ships never left the African coastline because the slaves succeeded in taking over the ships and, and, destroying, and destroying the ships as they left. There were probably many more, and the slave ship itself was always an unstable uh, complex of rule and governance and, and class struggle. And so that's an important moment that, that slavery was not the end of the line. It was the beginning of a new process, of a new struggle for justice and liberation. So as we wrap this up, let's recall, we have these Holocene transformations. And you can see every time the lines go down uh, the, the, on the top bar, there are uh, problems. Every time the lines on the bottom, which uh, relate to volcanic events, you have uh, these transformations. You have the crisis, I'll just give you a shorter version of this, you have the crisis of Rome, you have the crisis of feudalism, you have the crisis of the 17th century, which I talked about, which was resolved by going to the great frontier and all of this. But let's remind ourselves that these were moments of political possibility. Here we have a, a nice uh, probably 14th century late 14th century, early 15th century painting of the Grand Jacquerie, the great peasant revolt in, in France. It was not the only one. That, that as, the, as the little ice age arrived in Europe, this was a period of profound ferment and rebellion and resistance that basically defied the feudal rulers and said that feudalism's business as usual will not and cannot continue. So we want to keep that in our minds as we go through this uh, story. And so, so we want to keep one moment of this is that we have, a, uh, there's a moment of a political possibility. The other is that we have the dynamics of climate change pushing together various social forces and social movements that are not always on the left, but are significant, that are putting together these three great domains of capitalism's work. Remember, capitalism is about putting nature to work, including human nature, and it must do so cheaply. But, that, but capitalism can only mobilize work cheaply if the conditions of effective resistance from below are not there. Well, what's happening today is that you are seeing a, uh, in different parts of the world, and that's an important geographical observation, uh, uh, increasing working class uh, uh, rebellions. Uh, coastal China over the past five years is a great example of this. Uh, a new, uh, uh, a new uh, uh, sense of the importance of the feminist argument around social reproduction and unpaid work that also involves uh, questions of collective consumption in the urban built environment. And then finally, the work of nature as a whole. How are we putting these three moments together? So we are seeing movements for food sovereignty. These are teachers' strikes in the realm of social reproduction here and, and, and classic labor uh, uh, unrest in places like China that are all being, these movements are now increasingly forced to deal with each other and we've seen some very hopeful moments in all of this. So, 
to conclude, we want to think about not one, but at least four state shifts. One, obviously, in the biosphere. Okay. Two, Capitalism as a system of cheap nature, in part because of the first moment as climate change uh, unfolds, one of the key problems that emerges is uh, uh, producti- uh, stagnating productivity growth in agriculture, so it becomes harder and harder to increase agricultural productivity, which, by the way, is the reason why we can all be in this room, uh, that somebody else is growing the food that we can eat. Uh, that uh, we are seeing a crisis of, of capitalism as a geocultural system of domination as the questions of the climate class divide, climate patriarchy, and climate apartheid come to the forefront of world politics. And we are seeing a crisis of modernity as, or a state shift of modernity as a mode of thought, man versus nature, the two cultures. So how do we, inclu- how do we conclude for an ecology of hope? First, we have to cease to be afraid. Yes, there are real things to be concerned about, but fear will be the fear will feed into the anti politics of the apartheid, uh, of, of the anti politics of, of the Anthropocene system, and we need to look at the possibilities of of rethinking. Uh, our world and of re-narrating, of, of, of asking what stories do we need to find our way through the present planetary state shift. It seems to me that the stories we need will find as touchstones the care, the compassion, and the connection that is so deeply lacking in today's world. So when we, we need to ask, how do we act and think and love and organize our way through this state shift, which as we've seen is not one, but at least four state shifts. So central to world ecology has been the argument that we need to think and work and nurture and care in new ways, especially through an ethic of care for humans, for the web of life, and for the interdependencies the multi-species and biospheric interdependencies that make the good life possible. Thank you very much. Jason, thank you very much. Fantastic presentation. I'm very glad that, that you framed your argument about uh, this, this question of uh, ecology of hope. Because when one reads your books, one could get rather depressed. Well, because we can't imagine yes, exactly. a different way. Exactly. Good. But let's, let's start with Nikos. Nikos was listening, uh, was taking notes mm-hmm. in his head. So let me give you the mic. And you keep yours. Well, I mean, I, w- w- what I want to do is uh, it's not so much reflect upon the, the presentation, but actually pick it up from uh, where you left it. Good. Uh, because, I mean, the, the ecology of hope uh, is, is like a, a very intriguing to me uh, potential. And it's, it's unusual in critical debates to open up these discussions because, you know, it's always a war. Oh, we do such critical analysis of uh, what is happening and what happened before, but no one really has a very good idea about what we should do. And I think especially in the context of, uh, of an architecture school, uh, this is becoming kind of a, of a, of a big problem because, uh, you know, Students, architects, planners, you know, they actually need to propose projects, to propose ideas. Every project is basically a political argument about how things should be. And I think everyone is kind of insecure about how to position uh, their projects and their thoughts and their intentions uh, within the broader context that you so well described. Uh, And uh, having said that, I mean, in relation to, for example, to the sustainability discussion, we have seen, you know, mostly projects that eventually, I mean, uh, I mean, I, 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 it doesn't matter, let's say, if they have good intentions, they often end up just offering uh, the reinvention of new business models, you know. Eventually, actually, uh, being devices for endless accumulation and not devices for a different paradigm, right? So, you know, the sustainability debate, the, the resilience projects, all these, you know, master plans that we have been seeing of how to redesign the cities, redesign infrastructure. Now, just, uh, you know, uh, one more, you know, brick on the wall of, uh, you know, not being very satisfied with the, with the status quo. Uh, but what I want actually to, 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 to do in, uh, more particularly is link the whole debate with the very recent 
uh, emergence of these ideas of the Green New Deal and environment, not just as an economic development paradigm, but also as a social development. So for the first time, I think it's very clearly set in the political agenda, at least, that you know, sustainability is also about social inequality. And a, a developmental project on sustainability, like you know, the Ocasio-Cortez one, or you know, what Varoufakis and Sanders and Jeremy Corbyn have been trying to you know, frame around the Progressive International, it's like sustainability could be also a project for addressing social inequality. Uh, and I wonder what's your, um, what's your take on this whole uh, revival of the New Deal idea that the state should step in, but this time it should also do it by bringing together environment and you know social issues. And if there is, if you are skeptical about it, which are the things that we can still see as positive steps in this direction? Is the Green New Deal discussion like a, a way out? Is it a, a positive direction that we could actually take as this uh, colleges of hope? Or is it just, again, a remedy uh, for uh, ensuring the endless accumulation again? Well, I think it's both. Okay. I think, on the one hand, I'm extraordinarily happy and see it is a very hopeful sign that we have a kind of Green New Deal discourse on the part of social democratic politicians. On the other hand, we need to recognize that the the language itself, the model itself, is refers to an absolutely destructive productivist model uh, and a growth first model. And so in that sense, it is very much in line with the whole legacy of sustainable development conversations. I mean, certainly from 87, when we're given the Brundtland Commission report, which is a report chaired by a former prime minister of a Petro state. And let's remember also that the first Stockholm conference on the human environment that gave rise to the UN environmental program was financed by the oil company, Atlantic Richfield, ARCO, and was organized by a Canadian oil executive. So the whole discourse on sustainability has been a pro-growth perspective from the beginning. And yet, we have to be dialectical. We have to see that we have reached the point where there is now space to say that there are concerns about the state of life on this planet. And then it is up to the movements to point out that the social democratic models have uh, been part of the problem. So then the question becomes to what extent are figures like Sanders or Ocasio-Cortez in the United States or Corbyn willing to move to the left to socialize and collectivize issues of social reproduction in the cities? transport, health care, housing, child care, but also, and this goes to the heart of what a radical sustainability program would do, there has to be public mechanisms for finance. So we have to be able to break the, break the power of the banks. And if we don't do that, then there will be no sustainability in any sense, except window dressing. Melissa. Um, uh, you, you use the term uh, re uh, reparations ecologies. Um, um, I would like to ask you to, to speak about it a little more, no? And uh, perhaps uh, uh, to give examples, no? You have uh, uh, several uh, slides if have passed uh, on your screen that you didn't comment on directly. You, you spoke about, uh, you mentioned the notion of food sovereignty, you have also shown uh, a kind of protest over uh, indigenous lands. Um, you know, uh, how, how are these, uh, these, uh, these issues linked? What, 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 do, what does the notion of reparations ecology uh, uh, involve? You know, uh, on, on the one hand, it's a kind of a, 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 a let's say, a, 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 
very broad uh, uh, rectification of a kind of historical injustice <laughs> that you have described, you know, that, that uh, compares to, to the act of uh, paying war damage, uh, you know, from, from you know, one country to another or, or something like that. But on the other hand, I can imagine that there are, that there are many uh, smaller scale acts, <laughs> let's say, in the, in the daily life. And I think that, that those are uh, perhaps uh, uh, the questions that can engage architects most clearly in the debate. Because I think what, what we, in order to engage our profession, we have to address the problem of scale, right? I mean, if you speak about capitalism as a historical and a planetary phenomenon, but to undo it, ultimately, we have to start in the daily life. And uh, nevertheless, it is still a kind of a complex question, you know, where to begin, no? And, and with what kind of, uh, what kind of uh, projects on, uh, uh, to say so, everyday, scale of everyday life we can, we can start, right? So I, I think uh, my, my interest is in this kind of link between the notion of reparations, ecology, and the problem of scale. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, this is really a question of what, what, what needs to happen in the cities. Is that what I'm hearing? I think so, yeah. yeah. Uh, I mean, I think it's not only a city question, but it speaks to something much broader. So for Raj Patel and I, we end a history of the world in seven cheap things on the, the question of reparation ecology. That is not reducible to money payments because, as we know, uh, uh, the monetization of everything, that tendency is uh, one of the key drivers of the world as it is today, which is a world of profound violence and inequality. It is a call for, first of all, remembering, because there is a profound amnesia, especially in environmental thought. There's a profound amnesia of the sets of relations and the sets uh, and the kinds of domination that have created the present crisis. And that the present crisis is not merely a biophysical or biospheric crisis. It is a, a crisis uh, of the climate class divide, of climate patriarchy, of climate apartheid. So the question becomes, how, how do we undo that at every scale? And I think in the question of urban built environments, of course, countrysides have built environments too. And I think that's something that planetary urbanization speaks to in a very powerful way that, that, that world ecology and planetary urbanization are really engaging the same, the same problem or the same webs of problems. Um, that we need to look at not just reparation ecology, but reproductive ecologies in the broad sense, the reproduction of life, of social reproduction, of housing, healthcare, transportation, all of those questions that are fundamental to carbon reduction, radical carbon reducing strategies. So that's one, one moment of it. Also has to be based on re, sort of re-agrarianizing parts of, of the city so we, we overcome this town country divide which was at the center of the rise of capitalism. I think back to some of the earlier utopian, utopian imaginings of garden cities and all the rest of it. So we need reproductive ecologies. And sadly, well, maybe not sadly, I think part of it is, is sad though, we also need reconstructive ecologies. Because as I mentioned, in 100 years, 200 years, cities like Miami, or New York City, Amsterdam, they're not gonna be there or they're gonna be there only in very small fragments because at some point you can't build the seawalls higher. Jakarta uh, is going to be underwater. So uh, it, it would be underwater even right now if not for uh, the Dutch engineers. So, uh, so we, that is going to be a moment where all of these other R's come in, the reparation ecology, the reproductive ecology, the reconstruction ecology uh, come, come together. And so we are, going to need, we are going to need people who can understand these issues of 
socio-ecological injustice and know how to rebuild and redesign our cities, our infrastructures in a way that embodies planetary justice, not sustainability without justice, which is what we have had for decades from environmentalist and green politics and from social democratic politics. Well, good, since we have the two of you here, right? Uh, proponent of planetary urbanization of or what other geographers have called the urbicine and, and, and you who put uh, the emphasis on capitalism and what you call the capitalocene. There is common ground. Okay. It would be interesting to yes. address that yes. and where are the differences between the two positions. You want to go first? You want yeah, to? I mean, uh, if I can just uh, uh, expand a bit about a discussion that we had with, uh, with Jason yesterday. I was, um, I was asking him, uh, do you see any agency actually in the, in, the, in the way the world ecology is configured through capitalism? Mm. Uh, do you see any agency in the actual forms of the distribution of population, let's say in very simple terms? So let's say you take the United States, right? Uh, most of the population is concentrated in very particular zones. Uh, in the middle, you have a huge area of industrial primary production, basically. So is it possible to envision a different ecology without envisioning a different distribution of these settlement spaces? Is it possible to have, for example, sustainable agriculture in the US with the way the population is distributed right now, with the pattern, with the urban pattern that you have right now? Uh, I mean, this is just to, to, to actually highlight um, the, the major element behind planetary urbanization that actually the, the urbanization itself also has an agency uh, in this whole process. It's not you know, just the mode of production, it's not just capitalism, mm -hmm. it's also the particular form uh, that uh, settlement uh, takes, economic activity takes in, in, in place, uh, the organization of production takes in place. It's, it's a broader you know, geographic interpretation, but with an emphasis of urbanization itself, right? the concentration of people, the concentration of capital, the concentration of economic activity. Uh, and I know, you know that it's, it's impossible to address uh, you know, this question now, but uh, again, um, maybe this is, a, this is a way to reframe the uh, urbicene, capitalocene uh, relationship. Well, I think the danger of urbicene is if we take it too seriously. If we take it as a poetics, take it uh, take it if we take it as a poetics, then that's yes. great because, of course, the yes. world has become more urbanized. But then we run into the problem, we run into the tendency to treat urban, the urbicene as the expansion of city spaces, which runs into the whole object of the critique of planetary urbanization, which is methodological cityism, as uh, Neil Brenner calls it. And so that's, that's a danger, that it's, it's uh, the virtue of, of the many virtues of planetary urbanization, I'm going to address your question, is that the urbanization means, as I understand it, the urbanization of capital in a Marxist Lefebvrean sense. So the infrastructures that produce and reproduce the urban-centered accumulation of capital. So in that sense, it is very much about Marx's urbanization of the countryside. Do I have that? Exactly. Okay. Yeah, uh, okay. So I think that's where so many people are stuck in the old binaries of the city and the countryside as separate essences rather than dialectically constructed. Now, I think you're right. Of course, there is a certain fixity in Harvey's sense of, of settlement patterns. But over the past 20th century, over the past century, we've seen that be tremendously malleable, especially in the United States. The United States has been not only the, uh, uh, the point of destination of peoples from all over the world, starting with Southern and Eastern uh, Europe in the late 19th century. It has a longer history with Ireland and other places before that, but just over the past century. And then, of course, with East Asians, South Asians, um, Latin Americans, uh, uh, especially after uh, the 1960s. But internally as well, it has been a site of profound and rapid internal migrations, uh, especially uh, we can think of the great migration of African Americans to uh, northern cities, especially places like Detroit and Chicago in the first half of the 20th century. So I think, I think that the, the possibilities of reconstructing settlement and urban country city relationships in a place like the United States uh, are, are, are tremendously great and could be done in a 
way that would promote justice and sustainability. But it would require uh, the, the uh, socialization of capital. And again, it would require not just state planning in a democratic way, but also state financing. So the whole banking sector has to be socialized and rendered a public utility. It has to be decommodified. So I think that there's tremendous possibility for precisely as you indicate. Um, that I don't see it as too much of a barrier. So before I open the floor to questions, uh, the ecology of hope that, that implies uh, political uh, action, uh, resistance, uh, creativity, how could we apply it, Nikos, now within... This was your opening question okay, when you, you came uh, to the podium. How can we apply it to our disciplines? I, I will respond to with a, with a, with a question actually. Uh, so I, I was I don't know who who here uh, read the last issue of uh, AD Architectural Design. It was like a special issue. It was called Machine Landscapes, actually edited by uh, by Lian Yang. The, the the question was actually very interesting, and it brings together. Uh, both uh, your uh, framework on understanding that it's not just humans doing work, it's also nature, but also the planetary urbanization um, framework that, you know, urbanization is not just where the people are, it's also, you know, what's happening in the fields, it's what's happening in the infrastructure. So basically, the, the issue had a very interesting question. I don't think it delivered very well in, in providing an interesting answer, but the question was, uh, Increased mechanization means that basically less labor, less people. How do we design for landscapes with no people at all? We, to, to me, it was a very interesting was a question. question. That was the, the question of the, let's say, the editor. Yes. But I have to say the, the whole issue, it was a bit disappointing because it was not critical at all. It was basically like a celebration of these machine landscapes. Oh, look, logistics, how fascinating. Oh, look at all these boxes moving around. Soon they will be moving around without any drivers. Wow, how fascinating. How should we design for that? So I started thinking of this, that actually what is happening maybe one, one of the things that are happening is that some landscapes are getting very, let's say, simplified, if you want to say uh, this, this word. I mean, for example, a port uh, that is becoming more and more mechanized, uh, it's, a, it's a much more simple space in terms of you know, social activity and interaction than a port uh, in the 19th century that you could envision you know, all these uh, you know, uh, dynamics happening or the struggles happening. Perhaps it was like a, a hot spot for, a, for protest as well, for labor rights. Uh, and I'm thinking that you know, if basically, you, if you look at the big picture, if you look uh, of what are the places that we have uh, produced, uh, most of them are going to be soon uninhabited, right? They're going to be like machine landscapes, like highways, with you know tracks that no one is diving, basically, or you know, uh, well, that's the logic. That's the logic of capital, but exactly. there's no way that happens. Exactly, yeah. that's a fantasy yeah. of capital. And that was my question yeah. exactly. So, course, yeah. what do you think about all these debates of uh, automation, a universal basic income? That okay, let's just you know have a society of uh, of a basic income that people get compensated and the machines do all the work. Mm -hmm. Because f for us, it's also a very di different question. Because it's a different thing designing for some functions that are not described, that are you know, invented, for example. A city invents functions. No one really knows what's going to happen. But the machine landscape that is fully automated, everyone knows every detail of how it works. There is, you know, nothing is going to change. You designed it like that, it has to work like a machine. So if more and more landscapes are basically designed like that, I would say, I would say it's not a celebration issue of the, of the machine landscapes, for example, the AD. It's, it's very depressing because you are losing all this you know, element of surprise that actually good design is supposed to provide. So to me, it's like a... But again, I mean, I, I'm curious because, for example, from a Marxist perspective, no labor means no profit, right? If it was like com complete mechanization, there would be any, no, no, no accumulation margin, right? So I'm curious, w w what's your take on all this approach that thinks are towards a mechanized uh, you know, society that labor is basically subsidized, do nothing, with a universal basic income? Well, that will never go far. 
let's be clear, a universal basic income under capitalism. It's one thing to cut in 10 or 20 million European workers into a UBI, but they're not going to go to a universal basic income for 300 million Chinese workers or uh, 400 million Ch uh, Indian workers, right? So that's, that's one dimension of, of the process because as, as uh, we enter into a moment of the crisis of cheap labor, people always point, well, there's plenty of cheap labor all around, but in fact, there's a long run secular crisis from the 1970s of uh, labor productivity in the advanced capitalist world. So automation is this fantasy. Marx picks up on this in Capital. So Marx writes about the tendency for capital to move from what he calls the formal, sort of indirect uh, control of labor to the real control of labor, formal to real subsumption of labor. Now, of course, the, even the English textile factories didn't resemble that in when he, at the time when he was writing. And it's funny, a lot of Marxists take that to be an actual historical statement, which is false. But uh, so it's an imminent tendency of capital to uh, uh, give us the robot factory. So since the 1970s, from the 1970s, right, we were given that, uh, the picture of the future, which was the future of the robot factory. Instead, we got the global sweatshop. That's important to keep in mind. So, and, and I think that what happens with a certain kind of urban Marxism or urban critical theory is a fundamental misunderstanding of what happens in the countryside. First of all, most, work in the, most food in the world is produced by peasant smallholder agriculture. Still, the, the, a considerable majority. On the other hand, industrial capitalist agriculture has been in the midst of a decade-long stagnation of productivity growth. That means the rate of increase is slowing, 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 slowing. And, and if you go to a place like a cornfield in Nebraska, you will see as close to an automated factory in the field as can be. And it's doing nothing to enhance productivity growth. It's simply holding, holding the level. Climate change is coming in, is going to blow up the capitalist cheap food model, which is based on growing more and more and more food with less and less and less labor time. What does that mean for an urbanist? It means that the whole capitalist model of urban settlement will, and I think we already see signs of it, but will implode. So uh, that's, Let's yeah. Let's leave it there on the implosion. Yeah. Uh, let's open the floor to, for questions. Do you want to start? I hear your laugh. Oh, back there. Hello. Um, I'd like to reiterate a bit of what uh, Nico said and relate a little bit to the urban uh, and also focus on uh, the Chicken Nugget article that uh, was co-authored by Jason. Um, uh, it, it mentions uh, an activist who uh, talks about the notion of um, uh, the two DNA strands uh, being um, uh, rebellion, or not rebellion, but um, resistance and uh, the provision of alternative ways of uh, production. Um, and uh, this idea of farming and how uh, there's laborers um, who uh, are usually in the rural areas, but uh, the notion that if they are closer to the political environment, so the urban environment, uh, that that might uh, affect the uh, minimum wage uh, situation, any other social situations that laborers may have. So uh, how does uh, the effect of um, farming moving from rural to urban uh, affect the, the whole um, uh, situation of laborers, but also um, the biodiversity? Peasants moving from countryside to city or farming moving into the city? Farming and uh, the laborers. By, and what do you mean by that? Farming, move, do you mean like urban gardening? That yeah. kind of? Yeah, urban farming. Yeah, um, mm -hmm. as, as within the city and maybe not in a way that we've envisaged already. Well, urban farming is a uh, really a long durée feature of, of modern urbanization. Uh, uh, I think of 
mid-sized industrial towns in the United States, like Toledo and Muncie, Indiana, where uh, workers would routinely raise chickens or have small garden plots. So that's a very common feature of urban life across uh, the long run of, of capitalist urbanization. On the other hand, what you've pointed to about the movement or the cycling of peasants from countryside to city back and forth is fundamentally recast what it means to be a peasant. So the classic peasantries of earlier centuries uh, and, and the peasantries behind what Eric Wolf, the great anthropologist, called the peasant wars of the 20th century, Vietnam, uh, Mexico, those peasantries no longer exist by and large. The, the, the peasantries that exist now are peasantries that reproduce themselves partly through agriculture, but are partly through wage labor and other forms of informal economic activity. So they are what Henry Bernstein calls classes of labor. Now that doesn't mean they can't call themselves peasants, but they are fundamentally different from before. And I think what that signifies too, and we see this especially across Latin America, but many other places, Sub-Saharan Africa, you see this interchange of urban and agrarian activists that really is dissolving the boundaries and creating new possibilities for food and climate and economic justice that I see as extremely hopeful. No, which became very clear in, in the Arab Spring. Yes, precisely. Jennifer, no? Other questions back there? No, no. So, higher. Up. Higher up. Raise up. your hand again. Yeah. Sasha's getting his exercise. Um, so I, I just wanted to say um, that um, I, I completely agree with the argument, but uh, I would see the black, uh, the, the sort of colored uh, and white uh, binary bit sort of um, in the present time uh, f far fetched as well. Like it's it's becoming more sort of this foreign agent versus the rentier state kind of um, thing. Um, I say this because I'm coming back from the field um, from Delhi actually, and uh, and. Uh, the, it, it's one of the most extensively urbanized places right now, like if you see the metropolitan processes. Um, and it's all through Japanese money, actually, through, through Japanese uh, industrial manufacturers that move there and sort of reproduce what you could um, read as Engels, Manchester, like the tons of uh, towns that, look, that just look like Engels, Manchester. Um, what I saw, what I felt, um, just reflecting upon the um, ecologies of hope um, in Delhi, is that uh, the 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 whole ecological issue got pushed so much, and it's like one of the most polluted places in the world in terms of the AQI of of the air that you can literally see the air. It's it's um, you shouldn't see the air, but you see the air, and it's pushed it to such an extent that actually the social movements from the ground produced to, to take back um, or to sort of stop this mode of urbanization. And this is something that you're seeing in Delhi right now, that um, there's a very big ecological movement that emerges from the ground, which says, okay, no, we, 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 we need to stop down on sort of more infrastructure making or more industrialization, but rather sort of we need to renature spaces inside the city. This is something that's happening in really, really stressed ecologies at the moment. And that's something, if I can sort of contribute, I see as a, as a ecology of hope, let's say. So this was not a question. Yeah, great. This was an observation, right? No, it's, 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 it's a contribution. Sorry. Okay, contribution to the discussion. Other statements? Yes. Sasha, to the other side. Raise your hand, George, raise your hand. If we take as a fact that uh, capitalistic societies will continue to exist forever, uh, do you think that anything can be done uh, in an individual level? No. No. <laughs> so no to um, what? No, no to what? No, nothing can be done on an individual level. I mean, no, it so has to be done collectively. 
Yeah, social change, which is also environmental change, so, social change for justice is always collective. And uh, also, no civilization lasts forever. What about you know, the assumption she made that capitalism would live forever? Yeah, I think that's the ecology of hopelessness. Yeah. I think that's the Anthropocene. What is the Anthropocene program? It is, it is very close to Spaceship Earth from the 60s. It is give power to the engineers and the geoengineers and find an engineering a technical fix to the problem. The problem is that engineers are not well equipped to deal with the problems of the biosphere and they're not well equipped to understand questions of justice. I think you were too tough on Bucky Fuller. Uh, well, Bucky, yeah. we'll give Bucky Fuller credit for not being, for being an anti-Maltusian. No, you, you cannot. No, he was against Maltus. Yes. Yes, yes. He, yes. yes, we will give him credit for yes, being for against yes. Maltus. He had some very interesting ideas. But if you look at, at how, that's why I don't pick on him very much, uh, that, that Spaceship Earth was appropriated as uh, another form of technocratic white supremacist governance. Yeah, you can take it from that point of yeah. view. But on the other hand, Nick, I saw Nikos at Christmas and... And he pointed out to a document that, uh, that he had prepared with a colleague of, of his um, to reframe the entire architectural education mm -hmm. okay, uh, by putting the emphasis on, on resources, for example. I thought this was quite brilliant. Mm -hmm. Well, right. That, that is true. So, uh, uh, but, but the problem is not merely a design problem. It's not, it's not merely a design problem. Yeah. I agree with you. Uh, uh, so it really becomes true. one of... Uh, I, I actually find Fuller very interesting. Yes. Uh, and, okay, and you yeah, that? yeah. There is a question there. Uh, <laughs> sorry, one. Uh, oh, perfect. I found very interesting uh, the image that you uh, showed about the slave ship as a, as a typology that enabled uh, colonization and exploitation of resources, but also was the stage for revolt and for hope. And I was wondering what kind of spaces we have today where this is happening now, where like maybe it, it comes from a place of exploitation, but it in, invites to political action? Well, we have many slave ships around the world. Uh, of course, uh, one of the major ones is in the United States where still seven million Americans are enslaved, I mean imprisoned. But, uh, but of those, of those uh, two million are uh, working under conditions of unfree labor. So that's, that's called slavery. Unfree labor is a you know, euphemism for saying they're enslaved. They're deprived of their rights. They're expelled from society. So we are back again to civilization and savagery. We are seeing uh, a, a classic form of industrial proletarian revolt in, in coastal China. We are seeing movements across the world for various forms of agrarian and food justice. Uh, uh, perhaps best represented for all its problems uh, by La Via Campesina. And the food sovereignty argument is hugely important because it is not simply a demand for more food. It is a call for a new relationship to food and to life that says the right to f quality food, the right to gender and racial equality, the right to climate sustainability are all fundamental to the right to food. So that is what I would call a new ontological politics that is fundamentally at odds with the uh, distributionist model of capitalism and the society nature model. I think we see very hopeful responses to the unfolding climate crisis in places like Cuba without being romantic. We see that the, the Cuban state and, and the Cuban people, after the end of cheap Soviet oil in 1991, they enter the special period and no one starves and they bring agriculture into the cities and there is an agroecological peer-to-peer -peer model that is in play and very strong in Cuba. It still has to contend with the forces of industrial agriculture. So that's very hopeful. I think that uh, we see in, in the United States movements for 
reclaiming the cities and places like, and reclaiming the right to the city in places like Detroit, to ask new questions about how do we reinvent the urban space in a way that embodies class and racial justice and say the access to food and the right to social reproduction, to safety and healthcare and all of that. So there are exciting possibilities all over the world. I'm sure we could talk all, all into the evening about the kinds of possibilities that are unfolding. Indigenous movements across North America have led the way against extractive capitalism and have brought in younger environmental activists, and that's important, younger, because the mainstream environmentalists in the United States and Canada are part of the problem. So younger environmentalists, environmental justice uh, activists, labor activists, there is an emerging coalition to say, not here, not anywhere. and then one more there, and we, this would be the last one back there. Um, Get closer, closer. Yeah. That's, that's good. <laughs> yeah. um, what do you think is the role of governments against this capitalism, and, and especially with real estate developers, how uh, neoliberalism is building urban societies, how... Uh, cash flow foreign investments into different countries and yeah how do we make societies aware of this as well so the role of the state well so the role of the state over the past 40 decades and for four decades since the 1970s has been clearly to uh, the role of the state in the imperialist countries let's put it that way has to be has been to channel to channel and to operationalize the fantasies of finance capital so in the White House in the United States is a branch office of Goldman Sachs. And no, no, there's no hope. Where's the hope in the states? I mean, you, can't, you cannot throw the state away. Well, well no, no, far, far from it. So let's go again to the Cuban example without overstating that. that there, there is an example of, okay, how do we deal with the end of cheap oil, the crisis of industrial agriculture in a way that embodies... Uh, social justice and the right to food so that no one starves. That's a, that's, that's a powerful move in the modern world, which is a modern world that has been built on hunger and starvation and poverty. So that's an example of, of how states are, are called for. My friend Christian Parenti says that, that the state will always be called in moments of crisis. And so I think that we can look at the past century of socialist reconstruction without being romantic and look at the tremendous accomplishments of the Chinese revolutionary state in raising life expectancy from about 35 to 67 in three decades. I think we can look at the experience of Soviet Russia in smashing Nazism, which in 1929, Russia produces 67 trucks. By 1941, they're capable of, of uh, uh, waging a war with the Nazis that breaks the back of Nazi power. So those are, of course, there are many, many, many problems that we can identify in those projects. But if we are looking for an ecology of hope, the capacity of human beings to organize power in such a way to promote socially um, just ends is, is there. Even in the United States, the, people always say, well, the capitalist scene, what about the Soviet Union? What about the United States in World War I? Or World War II, pardon me. In World War II, the United States is a command economy. Prices are controlled, industrial production is set by the state. So this is entirely possible in relating to finance, that, that finance has to be liquidated and there has to be public utility finance, uh, financing, public utility banking. So private capital in banking has to be, has to be socialized by the state. By the state. Yes, absolutely. State. Yes. But it has to be done in a way that doesn't repeat the verticalist top-down problems of the past. It has to be horizontalist as well. That's not going to be easy. Last question. Yeah. Hello. Hello. Thank you for your presentation. Um, I had a question that goes along with the precedent question. So we talked about the world that is built with individuals and states, but um, as if individuals, individuals uh, grouped together, they had this tool that is called, and they made um, a company and uh, throughout the years, as uh, Noam Chomsky has pointed out, the companies uh, are taking too much power and are even uh, overgrowing over the states. 
uh, companies have more rights than humans, and they are the ones that have the wires, that uh, have the strings in order to control how the states will incline its decisions and all. And my question will be, how can we tackle uh, companies? How can we handle this problem? And uh, maybe in a way, as Noam Chomsky pointed out, or maybe with a collective consciousness, for example, uh, in France, there is this affair of the century, which two million people in France are attacking the French state in order to hold his promises for uh, his ecological promises that they've done, that they are not holding. And I wanted to know what do you think, how can we tackle the companies that are overgrowing? Well, I, I'm not sure that, that what we've seen over the past four decades is all that different from what we've seen in earlier eras of capitalism. Uh, I think what we learned after the globalization mania of the 1990s is that transnational corporations are deeply dependent on especially the imperial states. So there is an intimate connection there. I think that through finance, they succeeded in capturing state power such that it is, at least in places like the United States, it is impossible to talk about the relative autonomy of the state. The United States is a plutocracy ruled by the rich. And it's not a democracy. <laughs> it's never been a democracy, but it, it had a, the, the, dress, the trappings of one. So the the... That's, it's a very difficult question to answer because the politics in a place like France or Britain or the United States are very different from the politics in a place like Pakistan or, or Bangladesh. Uh, so, of course, for the colonial world, there was never any independence. There was never meaningful sovereignty, Maybe for a few minutes in the moments of social revolutions or something like that. So I, it becomes a very difficult question about how to discipline transnational capital. But it turns out that transnational capital is de deeply dependent on, say, their capacity to move about freely across borders, which can be tightly and immediately disciplined through capital controls and other forms of, uh, uh, of state regulation. But the problem is the states with all the power are the countries like the United States, which are not going to impose limits on, say, all the platform capitalists like Apple and Google that don't pay any taxes. Uh, so it becomes a, a difficult... I don't think there's any easy answer. I'm not sure... I'm, I see you struggling, and I'm struggling as well. So I'm going to say solidarity. And, solidarity. Yeah. <laughs> okay, we have one more question. Um, hi. Hi, Jason. Sorry. It was a wonderful talk. Thanks a lot. Very inspiring in terms of this, this tracing this long history, right? And you started by um, talking about the, the, the problem of that, that we have in thinking and our lives in the universities um, in terms of separating natural science from the humanities. How well do you think we are doing at this moment in terms of bringing together this dialogue between these disciplines? Let me give you two answers. The first one is my most hopeful answer, which is <laughs> that, that I've been very fortunate to travel around the world and talk with extraordinary scholars and human beings who are deeply committed to transcending this two cultures problem of the physical and human domain. And I think in places like, like design and in geography, you have, to deal, you have to deal with the physicality of it. You have to deal also with the meaning and the problems of representation and the problems of power, even if sometimes those are ignored. But you, there is an intellectual problem that asks us to grapple with all these different moments of the physical and the symbolic and, and the questions of power and inequality that necessarily demand of us to think in these different registers of the physical, the material, the symbolic, the social, all, all at the same time. So the response of universities, with very, very few exceptions, has been the interdisciplinary or multidisciplinary model, which far from, it's, it's back to what Ingalls, somebody mentioned Ingalls on the urban question, the capital just moves that, it doesn't solve the housing problem, it just relocates it, moves it around. Uh, and that's what interdisciplinarity does. It, re, it moves the pieces 
around, but it doesn't change the pieces. And so we have seen interdisciplinarity celebrated, but that's just green arithmetic. It's just adding up the pieces. It doesn't transform what it means to do earth system science. It doesn't transform what it means to do global political economy. And so we see those divides very strongly. We see that uh, who gets hired, who gets tenured, who gets promoted, who does well and who doesn't do well is structured by these, this two cultures, green arithmetic, disciplining dynamic. And so it becomes a matter of how do we practice not just civil disobedience in politics, but intellectual disobedience in the universities to break down these barriers. So how are we doing? I think probably us in this room are doing better than most in terms of really struggling to, to transcend uh, this problem of the separation of the disciplines. But the universities, we have to, we have to reveal multidisciplinarity as part of the problem. And, and somebody mentioned... Did you just mention resilience? Somebody mentioned resilience. And resilience is a great example of this, that it adds together the pieces without synthesizing them. So we have amazing scholars, for instance, out of the Stockholm Resilience Center, Johan Rockström and Kalle Foke and all these uh, people, who have no interest, no patience at all for design, for the humanities, for the qualitative social sciences. And that has to stop. And those, that behavior has to be revealed for what it is, which is a, an intellectual policy politics of planetary crisis and of, of supporting that, even if their work reveals the problems of it. All right. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, there's one announcement before we stop. Next Tuesday at 6 o'clock, we have invited two African uh, architects, uh, Francis Kere and Mariam Kamara. Uh, a very a young one, and they are both trying to bridge the gap between the north and, and the south uh, in H4 uh, at the Hill, Hill Building. And our next session is with Sasha Rösler on the 15th of April. So we'll have a long break till the next uh, session. So happy Easter, and we'll see you around there. <laughs> Thanks a lot, Jason. Thank you. Thanks, Nikos. Thank you.